balance and log on to pull everywhere because we're going to be using that to um, get your thoughts on various ethical questions. How many tables do you want to spread across? Um, I don't. It's not. We're not going to be working as groups, just as oh. a as a whole okay. body. So it's not that important how many. recording I'm going to use our microphones um, but thank you all so much for being here for what is actually the, the last installment of a series for the ethics pedagogy showcase um, we have a number of our two really great presentations today um, leading us in today's uh, session around embedded ethics is Roni Sadowski she's an ethics pedagogy fellow she's our fourth and final uh, presentation in this series that uh, started last week and continued into today. Um, so we're going to start uh, by having Roni go through a really phenomenal presentation uh, today um, for about 90 minutes, um, and then we're going to have a quick coffee break, and then we're going to conclude today's session with um, the emergent trends in uh, the teaching and learning of ethics uh, on Harvard's campus, a study that we've been doing at the, at the Edmund J. Safford Center for Ethics for about two years now, just over two years now, um, and that's going to be led by Jess a minor, our research director at the center, and David Kidd. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that after we have a quick coffee break. But without anything further, Roni, go ahead and launch us into today's session. Okay. So um, today's uh, session, this session is called Embedding Ethics. The, my goal here is to guide you in uh, a, a way of thinking about incorporating uh, ethics into your teaching, whatever subject matter you may be teaching, um, just to whet your appetite. This is a documentary challenging oh. the scientific consensus that vaccines are safe. It's one of at least five films that Amazon apparently pulled from its popular streaming video service. Leslie Manukian, a producer behind The Greater Good, says the film had been viewed more than 10 million times, mostly online where she claims companies have now adjusted their algorithms to reduce the movie's visibility. The American Academy of Pediatrics sent letters to some of the largest tech companies asking Silicon Valley to confront what it calls the spread of vaccine misinformation online. Facebook has pledged to reduce the ranking of pages that spread misinformation about vaccines. Google says it's reducing recommendations of content that can misinform users in harmful ways and Pinterest stops serving results for searches related to vaccines. So just to whet your appetite, I wanted to start with an ethical question. Um, are social media companies ethically responsible for addressing misinformation spread on their platforms about the safety and efficacy of vaccines? We're going to answer this question together, but not quite yet. Before we do, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Roni Gora Sadovsky. I am a JD PhD candidate in philosophy, which means that I have a degree from Harvard Law School and I'm working on finishing my PhD in philosophy. Um, I'm also, uh, this year, I have the privilege of serving as an ethics pedagogy fellow at the Safra Center and as a Bach pedagogy fellow in philosophy. Um, and I am a contributor to the Embedded Ethics Project, which is, um, that's, that's ethics with a capital CS. So, uh, this is a, a project, uh, some, some of you all are, are part of it, um, of incorporating ethics into the computer science curriculum here at Harvard. And I'll tell you all more about that, but that's kind of the perspective that I bring to the project here today um, and the experience that I have. So um, here's what we're going to do now. We're going to start off by identifying some of the learning goals for teaching ethics across the curriculum. Then I'm going to introduce the embedded ethics program that is uh, the model that we at Harvard have 
for incorporating ethics teaching into the computer science curriculum in particular. Then I'm, go I'm going to talk about extending this model to other disciplines, and we're going to use cases from computer science and from other disciplines to demonstrate what teaching ethics might look like in various different um, disciplines here and uh, across academia. And then uh, I'll address some of the challenges that I, I think um, may stand between us and, uh, and the task of incorporating ethics across the curriculum. Okay, so to start off, why even um, embark on this task at all? Why should we teach ethics? And in particular, why should we teach ethics outside of the standard philosophy ethics classroom? So I take it that there are a few different kinds of answers to this question, and that making those answers explicit might help overcome some of what the, the challenges that we're later going to talk about that are um, the obstacles to teaching ethics. Um, one reason that I think for me immediately jumps to mind when I ask myself why teach ethics is so that uh, we will equip our students to do a better job of confronting ethical challenges with whatever they go on to do with the skills that we teach them in our discipline. So if we're teaching them journalism, we want them to make ethically good choices as, as journalists. And that immediately raises, I think, questions and anxieties for many of us. Who are we to say what makes it an ethical choice better or worse? Who are we to say what makes the world better or worse? So I think that there are some cases where um, we don't actually experience that as an obstacle. Cases where we think that um, what's ethically better or worse to do is fairly clear. And this illustration is meant to illustrate that it's hard for, for us to think that the world on the right is a better one. Um, but sometimes it's less clear. And so I wanted to just um, put on the table that there are other ways of thinking about what's ethically better and worse. So one other way we might think about it is we might want students to be able to feel that they're acting in harmony with their own um, most deeply held values. Another way we might think about it is that we want students to be able to act in harmony with the values of their communities. Um, so these are, are ways of conceptualizing what makes a choice ethically better that don't depend on our um, feeling that we have to be the uh, judges of what makes, makes for a better world or what makes a choice ethically right objectively. There are other reasons we might teach ethics. We might teach ethics because our students need to pass a standardized test showing that, you know, to, for some kind of accreditation. Um, perhaps we are law professors and our students need to pass the ethics part of the bar exam. Um, we might also teach ethics because ethics is an inherently interesting subject that poses a lot of interesting intellectual problems. So that's a, a range of answers. You may also have other answers to the questions why to the question why I teach ethics, but let's focus on this set right now. So I wanted to um, to pose a, a an observation uh, and kind of a complaint to you, which is that um, the way that we teach ethics does not always serve all of these goals well. Um, so here we've got. Um, where, where do we go to learn ethics? Maybe bioethics, medical ethics, legal ethics, 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 which one imagines might happen in the philosophy department. <laughs> Out of this set of five reasons to teach ethics, I think that we do a great job of serving the bottom two. Um, we do a great job of preparing our students to pass ethics exams when they need to. And we do a great job of delving into the co complexity and intellectually fascinating features of moral problems in philosophy. Both professional ethics and philosophical moral, moral philosophy or philosophical ethics can sometimes do the top three things. They can help put our students in a position to make better decisions, whether that's objectively in light of their own values or in light of community values. But they don't always do that. Moreover, Outside of professional ethics classrooms and outside of moral philosophy classrooms, there's a lot that can be done to further these goals that we are not currently doing. So the purpose of this presentation is to put you all as teachers in a position to serve your students uh, in, in meeting the top three goals. And we're going to put aside for now uh, the, both the in, inherently intellectually fascinating features of moral philosophy and uh, the, the sort of purely uh, instrumental reasons to learn it. Okay, what do we want our students to get out of studying ethics? Uh, 
I have a, just as a, as a kind of cartoon way of visualizing this, I've plotted it on the body. We want intellectual, we want to give our students intellectual skills, the ability to analyze a moral problem. We want to give them the ability to see, uh, to notice moral problems as they arise in a particular domain. So if your field is, uh, say, say you're a scientist, you want students to be able to identify uh, moral problems as they arise within your scientific field. We want students to be able to listen and communicate across disagreements and not get stuck when they find that they disagree with others. We want to give them muscle memory to have um, so that when they're out there confronting an ethical challenge, they already know what it feels like to go through the process of analyzing an ethical question. We want them to feel that, it, that ethical considerations are worthwhile good reasons to act, and we want them to have the guts to bring up ethical concerns when they do arise and to feel that they can back, themselves, back up the um, concerns that they may raise. Um, so that we can think of the person who has these skills, this is a, a virtuous person, a person who has kind of like their, their ethics body is functioning well. Um, I think that thinking about uh, ethics in terms of cultivating <coughs> virtue is a useful model for teachers because we can ask ourselves then what kind of tasks we, might we be able to give our students that will help them cultivate one or many of these, uh, these different uh, capacities. Finally, one overarching learning goal that, um, that I have felt is very important to me in the work that I've done with uh, the Embedded Ethics program at Harvard is teaching students that ethics is a core disciplinary skill for whatever, whatever discipline they're studying. That ethics is already wound up with whatever work they're doing uh, in, any skill, in any discipline whatsoever. And that's true whether the students go on to work in that discipline or whether that's just a set of skills that they're adding to their repertoire. If our students are learning to code, we want them to see that coding has an ethical dimension. Okay. When we, as instructors, embark on the task of incorporating ethics into our teaching, we face a number of obstacles. And I'm going to get into these into, in more detail at the end of my presentation, but before I do, I wanted to um, preview one of them in particular. Um, when we teach ethics, we often are teaching controversial um, materials. And we may have, for, for reasons of our own kind of uh, job security, or uh, for reasons of conscience, we may have concerns about whether we are in a position to um, put controversial material in front of our students and handle it responsibly. In this presentation, I'm going to be doing just that. And one thing that I hope that we will be able to get out of this is I'm going to model one way of uh, putting a very <coughs> controversial topic in front of this group and moderating a discussion about it. Um, I would love to hear at the end of this presentation whether you think that I did it in, a, in a, an effective way and what kind of changes might be uh, worth implementing um, either for a presentation just like this one or for whatever your um, analog to it might be. So we're going to be talking about vaccines. And, um, and in a, this presentation on vaccines, I'm going to take the following empirical facts for granted. Vaccines are safe and effective. I'm not, um, we may disagree about that. You may know other people who disagree about that. For the purpose of this discussion, we're not t taking this empirical fact to be up for debate at all. Um, however, we have, I want to um, also insist that we, uh, that we operate under norms of inclusiveness for, for this discussion, including it, inclusiveness towards people who may disagree about the empirical assumption that I'm, a, I'm taking for granted. Um, we engage positions, not people. So a person may voice a view that they don't actually agree with. That's fine. A person may, um, may, dis, may come to change their mind over the course of this discussion or later on about something. So don't let the person be the symbol for the position that they express in here. Assume best intentions, and that's not just best intentions of the participants in this discussion, but also best intentions of the people out there in the world making decisions about vaccination, including people making decisions not to vaccinate, which under my assumptions, uh, are, it, that's a decision that endangers people. Humor is welcome, but not at the expense of other people. 
and try to be con cognizant of how much space you're taking up in the discussion. So if you're a person who tends to talk a lot, try to make yourself talk a little less. If you're a person who tends to hang back, try to make yourself speak up a little more. Okay. So those, that's the ground rules. Oh, before I move on from that slide, is there anything that anybody would like to add to this set of ground rules? Okay, so I've come up with the perfect ground rules. Excellent feedback so far, thank you. Um, I, this, this list was made up specifically, it was custom made for the vaccine issue, in particular assume best intentions for the reasons that I spelled out. So um, when you're teaching um, whatever controversies you want to introduce to your students, uh, I'd encourage you to think about what kind of failures you can anticipate might happen in your classroom and tailor the ground rules to that. Also, if you are able to, I think it would be better for these rules to come from the group and not from on high the way that I just did. The reason I did this is because we have limited time and a lot to get through. So I, I just wanted to um, get through it a little faster. Okay. With that, I want to tell you about uh, the program that we at Harvard have put together uh, to teach ethics in the computer science classrooms. Um, so Embedded Ethics is a collaboration between the computer science and philosophy departments involving uh, faculty from both departments and uh, postdocs and graduate students in philosophy. Um, philosophers visit computer science classes uh, typically once over the course of the semester to teach a module. Um, that module consists of a lecture plus an assignment, availability for office hours, um, sometimes graded feedback on the assignment, um, and that may vary depending on the size of the class and uh, because we teach classes that are anywhere from a, a big introductory lecture class to a very small and intimate seminar. Um, so the, the philosophers and computer, science, computer scientists work together to uh, generate curricular content that combines the core class, uh, the core issues that the class addresses with uh, deep questions from moral philosophy. Uh, to, to give the students a kind of bite-sized task that they can engage with. We go right into the classroom where the computer scientists already are, so they don't think that they've signed up for philosophy, but bam, they have a philosopher in their classroom. Um, and as I mentioned above, uh, we aim to show computer scientists that right alongside design thinking, technical skills, and problem solving that they are familiar with as core computer science skills, ethical judgment, and ethical reasoning is also a core skill for computer scientists. So the first case that I introduced in the video at the very beginning of this presentation is a case that I used in, a, in a, an embedded ethics lecture that I gave in CS51, which is the, um, the second core programming class that you would take if you were a computer science major at Harvard. So uh, I, gave, I showed students the same video that I just showed you. Um, and then ask them to have a discussion about whether, when it is that social media companies would be responsible for anti-vaccination, for the harms caused by anti-vaccination content being shared on their platform. So I know that some of you walked in late, so just as a, a recap, here's the problem. Um, various social media companies have been identified as part of the cause of uh, decreasing rates of vaccination in, um, which, is a, uh, the, which is itself the cause of the current measles outbreak in the United States. Um, there's a huge amount of anti-vaccine con conspiracy theories shared on Facebook. So here, for example, is a Facebook group called Stop Mandatory Vaccination, which has over 150,000 members and where you'll find articles like this shared. So this article claims that anti-vaccine Japan has the lowest child mortality rate of any country in the world. Um, this article was shared on Facebook over 200,000 times um, and got all kinds of interaction uh, with it. Um, the health, health Feedback and Credibility Coalition, which are two different nonprofits, rated uh, the top 100 shared health-related articles on Facebook. This one was, I think, number 35. And it, it got the lowest possible rating, negative two, not credible and potentially harmful. Um, if you're curious, what's false about this is that Japan is not anti-vaccine. It does have a very low child mortality rate, and there isn't a clear explanation for that. 
but the explanation is not has nothing to do with Japan being anti-vaccine because it has a vaccine schedule just like the U.S. does. Okay, so if you have not already done so, please use your oh whoa, whoa. Please quit the presentation. Hang on. I'll bring it back in a second. So get out your mobile device, and um, we will use poll everywhere to get your thoughts on this. Yes. So you can either go to pollev.com slash Roni, R-O-N-N-I, or you can just send a text message to 22333 with Roni as the body of the message. That will log you into our Poll Everywhere um, activity for this session. I'm seeing some people are still doing it. question we're going to be answering, if you're still not done, the, the instructions will reappear again, don't worry. Um, the question we're going to be answering together is, are social media companies ethically responsible for addressing misinformation about vaccine safety shared on their platform? When I say, are they responsible, you might wonder, what do I mean by responsible? So there's a lot of controversy around this, but just as a quick rough and ready definition, uh, the company is responsible if it's at fault or to blame for the harm if it ought to have prevented the harm or ought to prevent such harm in the future, and if when the harm has already taken place, it ought to remedy. Or and? Uh, I would think of these as ors, but um, this definition actually won't hold water. So uh, if, if we get into the nitty gritty, we'll find that these don't actually work as a definition of, of responsibility. This is meant to kind of give you a feel for what we're asking. Oh, and if, yeah, so it should not it should not be activated yet. Okay, so now, in a moment, if you've got your mobile thing ready, um, this was going to like flash and then it'll let you vote. Come on. Let me give it one more shot. We're having a technical problem. It doesn't want us to vote. <laughs> that is right. So we're gonna we'll move to the alternative technology, and hopefully this thing will wake up. So. Um, if you think that Facebook is responsible for the harm caused by, by anti-vaccination content shared on that platform, raise your hand if you think it is responsible. All right, hands down. If you think Facebook is not responsible, a very small minority <laughs> consisting of Kaya. All right. <laughs> um, so um, Kaya, I'll come back to you if you don't mind. But um, for now, will somebody from the majority tell me what's, the, what's their reasoning? Why do you think Facebook is responsible? So Not I don't sorry. think they're, they're responsible for the first posting, but as that grows, they know that their platform is being used for misinformation, so that becomes their responsibility. So um, one key uh, feature of the situation that you're identifying is that Facebook knows that its platform is being used in this way. Correct. Um, and can do something about it. 
and that they can do something about it. Nice. Others? Yes? I think one aspect is that probably only they can do something. Uh-huh. So if there were another agent, what about the users? The users could not post that stuff. Yes. But it, Facebook is the only other party that can do something about it. OK. Fine. OK, so it's not that Facebook's the only party that has the power to act. It's that other than, um, I'll just fill in, you didn't quite say this, but let me know if this is about what you mean. Um, other than the people who have the wrong beliefs about the issue, people who think that vaccines are not safe and effective, Facebook is the only entity that has the right beliefs and the power to do something about it. Is that about right? I don't know about their beliefs, but yeah. <laughs> okay. other parties can't, you know, can't moderate. Mm -hmm. Only Facebook can. Mm -hmm. but, absent, then, but why not? Legislation. Why not think that the fact that the users could um, act differently would provide you with the, the you, you were kind of building an argument that if there's just one agent who can act differently to, to avoid the harm, then that agent is responsible. But we identified that there are other agents who could act differently, namely the users. So why doesn't that undermine this argument? Yeah, Javier. I guess, I mean, to add to this point, you could say, uh, well, other users can interact uh, with the post and downvote it or whatever. Facebook is in the unique position to moderate, uh -huh. which adds unique. It's a unique power, and therefore you might think unique responsibilities. Uh, okay. Okay. Nice. So um, Facebook has the. It, it's true that other agents could have acted differently in a way that would produce a different result, but Facebook is the only kind of single agent that can do the task of moderating all of that content, whereas each individual user can only decide whether to share or not share, or post or not post their individual thing. Does anybody else want to speak for the, the um, position that Facebook is responsible? Yes? Uh, partially a point of clarification. Does, does Facebook and its algorithms promote certain videos based on their likelihood of people watching them? If, if that's true, then I think there's an element there of Facebook is actively promoting these, then that would, I think, make them more responsible. But I'm not sure enough about the facts of yeah. the works to, to claim that. So it's certainly true of YouTube. We know that YouTube tends to promote content that's controversial and polarizing because that tends to keep people on their platform. We also know that Facebook has an, a strong incentive to keep people on their platform so that they scroll more and see more ads, which is their source of revenue. So. It seems safe to assume that Facebook is probably showing um, content differentially depending on its ability to do that. And we might surmise from what we know about YouTube that Facebook also wants to promote controversial and polarizing content for that reason. We don't know, um, I don't know whether that, all those things are true. And what we did learn from that clip that I showed at the beginning is that Facebook is now aiming to address this problem of anti-vaccination content being shared by trying to, de to, to downgrade its um, algorithm's tendency to promote this kind of content in particular. Yes? Um, so I think one question we haven't discussed is whether the content should actually be taken out of the public domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should it be moderated? So, right. So uh, we, I, I said that we're assuming that um, vaccines are safe and effective, but it does not follow from that that um, material claiming that vaccines are not safe and effective should be removed from the public domain. So what do you all think? Yeah. Um, perhaps, it's, perhaps Facebook is being inconsistent with its mission statement and its policies as well. I mean, that's just a purely kind of internal critique, as it were, about, about their consistency. And I'm no expert on what their policies are. But you could make it, as to say, as a formal inconsistency in what they're doing vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, in relation to what they say they're doing. Yeah, so, th so this isn't quite an answer to that question, but it is another grounds on which we could say that Facebook is or isn't responsible. Is it, um, let's say, keeping its promise to its users or keeping its promises to the public? What about the question, though, of whether this material should be shared or should be um, publicly available or not? Yeah, Danielle. Well, I mean, the basic challenge is that Facebook helped invent the end of, say, publishing gatekeeping, right, made it therefore much easier for fringe material to circulate widely. Um, and so 
it's, I think, the, from my point of view, the question of whether such particular stuff should be um, public or not is not exactly the right question. Um, it's rather a question of um, how you um, have adequate filters on material so that things that don't meet set of standards um, don't get wide circulation. Mm -hmm. So from my point of view, it's about that scale question rather than you know, public or not. So that also actually also puts the question of Facebook's responsibility on kind of a, a bigger stage than it had been in our discussion previously, because we'd been thinking kind of um, you know, on the assumption that Facebook already exists and operates in the way that it does, um, Facebook has this power to moderate, and so maybe it has the responsibility to do so. But you're saying, we don't need to take it for granted that the world is such that there are social media giants at all, or that material becomes publicized because people like it. On, you know, all of that is Facebook's doing. And so Facebook might, have, might acquire responsibility from the way that it changed the media landscape generally. OK. We've got a lot on the table on the pro side. Do you still want to speak for Khan? Um, I acknowledge that Facebook is responsible for, let's say, coming up with a reporting system. Like if I see an outrageously false post about vaccination, then I think they should embed something that's, you know, that makes it possible for users to report you know, potentially harm content and so forth. So I'm not completely denying Facebook's responsibility. I'm just saying that my position is that I think I believe in epistemic responsibility. Like I think each one of us is responsible for making judgments about what we see and what we believe. And um, if, yeah, so that's the main reason that I uh, don't really think that Facebook is like mainly responsible for moderating the content. Mm -hmm. So um, this could be connected with a with the question of whether that content should be out there. That if you think we have a great deal of responsibility for um, ensuring, for kind of moderating our beliefs in light of the facts, then um, that will tend to come with the belief that uh, there's less of a responsibility of media providers to ensure that we're always confronting true, you know, true reporting. Yeah, and also you can moderate, you can provide feedback to your algorithm, algorithm by um, following or following certain types of news resources. So for example, what I do, when I am on the news feed or feed page of Facebook, and if I see a certain page promoting like dubious information, I immediately unfollow it. And that way, or like if I, another way that I put my feedback is like when I see cute cat pictures and I get to see more of it, then I like it or like share it to sort of like message to signal to Facebook that I really want this more of, of this kind of content. So you, so I think users have also the power to sort of arrange its own, you know, what he or she sees on the news feed. So this is interesting because what you're speaking to the power that individuals have, not only the individuals that we mentioned before, those who are sharing this media, but also those who are observing it, have some power to influence the, the algorithm um, by giving Facebook their own feedback on whether they like it or not. Um, so that, um, that then gets aggregated into a kind of wisdom or, or stupidity of crowds as the case may be. Um, in fact, we know that uh, that aggregated feedback has generated a great deal of promotion of this content. Um, and many people are interacting positively with anti-vaccine stuff on social media. Um, so there, there's still the separate, there, we might say, OK, users have so much the more of an obligation to uh, interact negatively with harmful material that they find on social media. But since many users are not meeting that obligation, there's still a separate question of what Facebook might do in the position of a moderator. So all of this is not to answer the question, but just to show you how we can open up the question for discussion. Um, when we um, discussed this with the students in Computer Science 51, the, um, we had a discussion very much like this one. And I, uh, I wrote down on the board criteria that came up over the course of the discussion, some of which came up here. So intention, causation, foreseeability, cost-benefit analysis of um, if, you, if you do an intervention, what other costs might it have. Um, we also talked about um, some problems in assessing whether Facebook is causally effective, namely that um, we could imagine a world where Facebook knows that if it kicks all the anti-vax people off its network, they'll all just re-aggregate somewhere else, like on Twitter or MeWe or some other um, social media site. 
And then, arguably, Facebook doesn't have the power to moderate because it can only moderate its own platform, but it can't keep its users from going elsewhere to do the same harm. And, the, and then um, we had a discussion of the question, what follows from that for Facebook's assessment of its own responsibility? So this is now a pretty complicated metaphysical question about causation. And the students in Computer Science 51 who had not signed up for a philosophy class were fully willing to go there with me. Um, and, and one reason that I thought it was important to take them to this complexity in particular is because when they go on to do their first jobs, whether it's a summer internship at Google or Facebook or um, some job uh, after graduating, if they, if they get um, assigned a task that they find ethically challenging, they know that there's always somebody else who can, if they object, there's always some other engineer waiting in line to do it. So they might ask themselves exactly that same question. Do I really have the control of deciding whether I'm going to be causing such and such ethical harm to transpire, given that if I don't do it, somebody else will do it? So I think this is a question that our students need to confront in their lives. And this uh, issue about Facebook turned out to be a very effective vehicle for showing students that that question is not so straightforward and giving them a kind of first crack at answering it. Okay, so that, so much for computer science. I want to um, now introduce you to uh, sort of, you know, take, take the vaccine issue across other disciplines in the university and, uh, and show you what it might look like to confront it uh, in a different uh, disciplinary setting, but also under a different ethical guise. So suppose now that you're teaching journalism. Um, here's a, another video to introduce you to uh, an ethical problem that arises related to the vaccine issue. There are almost two languages here. There's the language of science and then there's English. When scientists speak in their language and the rest of us translate that into English, it sounds like they're saying something very different than they're saying. Based on what we know right now, we don't think that there's an association, but that's not saying with 100% certainty there isn't one. That is saying that based on the evidence that we have right now, we don't think that there is one. Either because the reporter doesn't understand what's actually going on, uh, or because they're looking to generate a story, they then take that and make it seem as if the scientist is saying, I think there's a possibility that vaccines do cause autism, when in fact that's not it at all. Exasperated health officials are trying to come up with new ways to communicate with the public. Brendan Nyan conducted a study and watched how hesitant parents reacted when they were shown information from the CDC website stating there's no evidence the MMR vaccine causes autism. The good news was it did cause parents to be less likely to believe in the myth that the MMR vaccine causes autism. The bad news is, however, that it made them less likely to say they would vaccinate a child which is precisely the opposite of what we would hope to see. What we found is that telling people the correct information uh, wasn't actually effective. That may mean we've reached the point where public health officials in the media can't even talk about vaccine safety without it backfiring. Okay, so here's the ethical question I'm gonna ask you to answer. Suppose that you're the managing editor of the science desk at CBS News. You have a, um, a video correspondent, they are working with you and they pr generate the following segment and you're deciding whether to air the segment or not. A new large study finds the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine does not increase the risk of autism. The new study, if we needed it, puts to rest once again that there is no association between measles, measles vaccine, and autism. The study, published in Annals of Internal Medicine, looked at all the children born in Denmark over more than a decade, and also found the MMR vaccine does not trigger autism in children at high risk of developing the disorder. Okay, so will you run this story? Let's take a few seconds to think about it. Let's see if the polls are good. Ah, technology. <laughs> okay. We'll give up on the, on the electronic polling. So raise your hand if you would run the story. Okay, hands down. And raise your hand if you would not run the story. 
Okay, so we've got a majority for running it um, and a minority against. So let's hear once again from the majority. So why, given what we just learned, that um, when, when you put the facts in front of parents who are deciding whether to vaccinate, they, uh, they do seem to incorporate the new knowledge that, um, say, vaccine is not, vaccines are not associated with autism, but it seems to reduce their likelihood to vaccinate. Given that, why would you run that story? Yes, Al. People should have truth. People should have truth, and they should be in a position to argue with other people that they confront in their dinner parties uh -huh. who might have the mistaken view. OK. So one thing, so you, you mentioned having access to a search engine. So I just want to flag that this, um, we're now speaking from the perspective of uh, a big news corporation. So uh, we're on the other side of the kind of um, internet and social media spectrum. Um, this, is a, this is this company that's serving up its filtered version of uh, reality. Um, does, that, does, does that sort of, place that we situate the question change to your uh, analysis at all? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, did you have a hand? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think that there are different ways of communicating the truth as well. Mm -hmm. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the first study was uh, showing the, uh, uh, like the writing. That's right. Whereas here you have a doctor in the, you know, White coat has all the authority in like little bits, uh, digestible information. So I think this has. Uh, I'm not sure whether this uh, little episode falls under that category of the study was made. That's a really good point. So we don't know whether the whether we can generalize from that study about how parents react to text version of this information to this. Um, I wanted to. I, I think it's a great point. I wanted to just share anecdotally that in the process of preparing this presentation, I watched a lot of vaccine-related reporting <laughs> from a lot of different times, and um, I noted. I didn't do a study, but I noticed anecdotally that the older the media was that I was looking at, the more likely it was that we would see um, video of children with autism. The newer it was, the more likely it was that we would see video of children who were immunocompromised or who had whooping cough or measles. Um, so you'd see like these coughing babies. So there was like a um, response by the journalism profession to what we know about people's tendency to empathize and react. Um, also, this kind of gravelly voice doctor who is not using the science speak that we saw in the, that clip, you know, of like, based on what we know right now, we don't know that there is an association. He was like, if we needed it, I don't, I don't see why we even need this study, but once again. <laughs> um, so th that's, that's a characteristic of the newer reporting on vaccines and autism and totally in opposition to what you would see in reporting in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, okay, so does anybody who voted no that they would not run the story want to um, share their reasoning? Yes, Daniel. So I, I mean, I, I probably take these questions in too literal a way, but um, so I wouldn't have run it as is. I thought it was poorly edited and extremely confusing, mm -hmm. and it would be very hard for most people to actually follow what the uptake was. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have run it as was, but I, you know, not to say I would not run a story. Okay, so what changes would you recommend? Uh, I would. I may mean, have to watch it again to say, but it would be a matter of rescripting some of the dialogue. Uh -huh. is, it, is there anything in particular that you noticed, or is it well, just clarity? Both the beginning and the end. Frankly, I thought if you weren't a quite highly educated person, you were not actually going to get the takeaway okay. message and what the study said. I thought so, you, you you could leave quite confused by what the study result was. And it, the last bit about like, yes, people with a likelihood of autism who didn't get triggered. Yeah, leaves you thinking. Well, then maybe the other category of kids would get triggered. So. Um, in, de in defense of CBS News, I edited this down for length, so it might be that some of this. Uh, I'm, I might have edited out some of the clarifying okay. material. Entirely possible. Yeah. Uh, Jess. Building on that, that was um, my basic uh, thought too, was just that the way it was edited left it confusing, and yeah. so I was worried that the same 
response might happen from parents and the wrong message might be taken away. People were just trying to filter through what that means. I also think it's unhelpful uh, to run a story like this that's still focused just solely on the link to autism without actually presenting information about efficacy with preventing measles, mumps, rubella, and what happens when we don't vaccine. So the narrow focus over to connection to autism sort of still steers the story uh, in the wrong direction and should at the very least focus on the purpose of the vaccine and whether it's effective at that. This is really great. So um, both Jess and Danielle are doing something that we, we really try to pu push our students to do when, uh, when we teach this material in computer science, which is to say, um, although I gave you a question that had a yes or no answer, your answers were, well, no, not this way, but I would do it a different way. So, um, so one thing that we try to push our students to do is not to just say, um, you know, up or down, go or no go, but also say how. So suppose that you're working for a tech firm, or, or for the matter, for a, a news corporation, um, and, they, and you're asked to do something. Um, I think students are able to intuitively see that they can put their foot down and say no to something that they find ethically concerning. But one thing that we as teachers can give them is um, to, to sort of broaden the scope of, of the options to include do it a different way or advocate for doing it a different way. If a student is merely in a position to say, um, I find this clip objectionable, I don't want to air it, um, then what we've equipped them to do is to say no. But we'll do better for them as teachers if we equip them to say, but I would do it if we could do it this way, or if I may suggest an editorial change. And that's especially important when our students are in starting positions in the workforce where they don't have a lot of, um, of let's say, veto power to just you know, put their foot down and say no and have the thing actually not happen. Um, it may be that our students are uh, most powerful when they're in a position to advocate for doing something in a different way. Um, so just another bit of food for thought for you all as teachers. Um, when you give your students a task like this, uh, if we had more time, it would be great to ask all of you to say, okay, what would be, um, what way of reporting this would be acceptable to you, if any? Um, and that might be a kind of assignment that we could give in connection with this issue. Yeah. I notice in your handling of our reactions to your questions, you haven't done the route some ethics teachers may go, which is to say, and this brings us to utilitarianism, or this brings up the ontology. I mean, is that, that deliberate? You're keeping it very close to our reactions and our reasons for them without bringing in you know, the usual suspects. Yes, that is deliberate, yes. Okay. Um, I think that bringing in um, big moral theories can be useful if it's, uh, if it's being done toward a, a pedagogical end that makes sense in light of your learning goals. Um, in this particular setting, I'm, uh, we have a kind of weird um, teacher-student dynamic because I'm trying to both um, show you what I would do if you were actual undergraduates or high schoolers who are in an ethics class um, and model for you how I would handle these things. But I also know that you have students of your own and that part of what I want to give you is um, tools um, for that. So when I'm making that decision, I'm operating in the guise of modeling for you. And the reason I'm doing that is because I assume that for introductory students, introducing that stuff would not be a useful step for um, helping them work out an answer to this. It could be, though. And if you can imagine a way that it would be useful to your students to be equipped with that vocabulary, by all means, introduce it. Um, so in computer science, uh, I uh, was a, a teaching fellow for a course that was a, unlike the, the, computer, the embedded ethics model that I just introduced you to, we had a course that was a semester-long engagement with artificial intelligence and ethics. And in that context, we did give the students the um, names of the theories and gave them exercises that involved them having to sort arguments into different categories depending on which theory they belong to. And the reason that we did that was because we saw that as a, a skill that would um, serve them in identifying ethical disagreements. So if your disagreement is rooted in the fact that you're coming from a deontological point of view and your interlocutor is coming from a consequentialist point of view, then it serves you well to be able to identify that and give it a name. 
Um, but by the way, when we give our students an assignment to do with that, we ask them not to use the names because we, we were thinking, you know, if you're communicating with somebody out in the real world, they're not going to find it cute that you're like, well, that's actually deontology. <laughs> so, so we asked them to um, both be sorting arguments into these categories and also do it without using um, any jargon. So what language do you teach them to use? Um, we would say things like, uh, I'm thinking about this in terms of rights and you're thinking about this in terms of outcomes, for example. Um, okay. One more case study, this time, <laughs> now we're in education. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, the weird thing about education is that you're teaching teachers, so, okay, I'm, and I'm teaching teachers. Let's pretend that you all are education students, so you're getting a degree in education because you are going to eventually be teachers. Um, and so in this classroom, I, and standing in for what you might do if you were in the field of education, which is um, teaching the education students about issues that come up in education. I apologize for the many levels of education going on here. Seven-year-old Marin Blake is a second grader at Champlain Elementary in Burlington, Vermont, a school her parents picked for her back in kindergarten. Not because of class size or test scores, but based on how many students had all their vaccines. Mom Mia Hockett was anxious because Marin was in the midst of treatment for childhood leukemia, diagnosed just before her fourth birthday. The intensive chemotherapy compromised her immune system, making her vulnerable to diseases. Hockett isn't just a mom, she's also a doctor. And she wanted a school with vaccination rates of at least 90 to 95 percent, which public health officials say is required to protect those who are vulnerable or can't be vaccinated. In every state, children can get waivers for medical reasons. 47 states permit families to skip vaccines for religious beliefs. 18 also allow for personal or philosophical exemptions. Some states are moving to tighten their laws, chief among them California, which in 2015 did away with all waivers except for medical exemptions. Kindergarten vaccination rates have jumped to the highest levels in more than 15 years, nearly 96 percent. Immunizations are something that I do every day that I know makes a huge difference. Reinhardt and other doctors helped push the state to tighten Vermont's vaccine laws. So did Hockett, with Mia in tow. In 2015, lawmakers eliminated the state's philosophical exemption. Parents can still opt out for religious or medical reasons. Are your children vaccinated? No, they're not. Ariel Brewer Louis is a Vermont mom of three. We caught up with her during an event for those who question the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Partly because of the change in law, Brewer Louis is homeschooling her eight year old. But she is relying on the religious exemption to send another daughter to preschool. What is your religious objection to vaccines? I don't have a religious ex objection to vaccines, but that's my only option. And the way I see it, I have done my research. And there's no way I'm going to vaccinate my children to send them to school. What do you say to people who say to you, I should have the right not to vaccinate my child? I absolutely agree with that. But none of this legislation actually forces somebody to get immunized. What it says is that if you are opting out of your right and responsibility to vaccinate, then you also have to bear the burden of opting out of the benefits of organized education. Here in Vermont, parents have at most six months from the start of school to either make sure their child has all the required vaccinations or to claim an exemption. If they don't, that child is no longer welcome at school. Okay, so here's your question. This all um, takes place in Vermont, which just recently eliminated the um, so-called philosophical exemption to um, vaccination. Suppose that Vermont is considering going the way of California and eliminating the religious exemption as well, so that only medical exemptions to vaccination would be permitted. Do you support a bill that would do that? Sorry? Okay, I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Raise your hand if you support the bill eliminating the religious exemption. Okay, 
hands down. Raise your hand if you oppose the bill. And a lot of you didn't vote. Interesting. <laughs> OK. Not sure what to do about that. Yes? Is there? Do you know how many people actually take up the religious exemption and how sort of like uh, important that is in religious, various religious communities? Um, so I, I can speak a little bit to the kinds of reasoning that people use to object on religious grounds to vaccination. Um, I don't know the percentages, um, but I see why that's relevant, and I will come back to you to explain why. Um, okay, so uh, what kinds of uh, religious objections do people have? Um, one thing that um, many of us know is that Jehovah's Witnesses object to vaccination on the ground. I think that it, um, well, I, I actually don't want to even butcher it, but uh, on, on religious grounds. Um, there are also some vaccinations that use um, materials that are uh, harvested from human embryos, and some people object to that on, on the grounds that um, a human embryo is a person, and so using material from a human embryo is impermissible. I wonder if we could hear from those who did not vote, and if you could tell us why you didn't feel comfortable raising your hand for either. Yeah. I'm still confused a little bit is because um, my position is more about supporting people's, like the doctor articulated, um, supporting people's individual freedom of decision to not do that, but then also having to then bear the burden of not being allowed to enjoy the public school. So I guess what I'm total, not totally clear on with the question is um, if this bill would enforce that approach, um, or if the bill, you know, would mean that if you have the religious exemption, right? So that means it, it, it would it take away the religious exemption altogether, as opposed yes. to say, you can have a religious exemption, but that also then means you must keep your kid out of school. Okay, so, so um, yeah, so let me clarify that. So the, the religious exemption is an exemption to the requirement that you get vaccinated in order to, or that, you're, that if you're the parent, that you vaccinate your child in order to enroll that child in school. So if there is no religious exemption, then the only, uh, the only children who can enroll in school without being vaccinated are those who have a medical exemption to vaccination, i.e. a doctor has signed up that they can't safely be vaccinated. So a child like the one that was featured in this story, who's immunocompromised, can't get vaccinated, that child would still be allowed to go to school without vaccines. But no other child, no child who did not have that kind of exemption to um, vaccination would be allowed to enroll without vaccination. So in the case of the family that we saw at the very end of this um, clip, uh, the older child, the eight-year-old, is being homeschooled because the mother is not um, vaccinating or, but the parents, I, they always blame the moms. <laughs> the parents have chosen not to vaccinate those kids. And, um, and so the, the older kid is being homeschooled, but the younger kid is being sent to preschool on a religious exemption, even though the parents don't have an actual religious objection to vaccination. They're using the religious exemption as a philosophical exemption since that has been eliminated. So that family would have to either vaccinate the kids to send them to school or homeschool all the kids. Does that, so let's do the vote again. <laughs> this time just vote, even if you aren't sure, just take a side. So um, raise your hand if you support the bill to eliminate the religious exemption so that only the only unvaccinated kids in school would be kids who can't safely be vaccinated. Okay, hands down, and those who oppose this bill. Uh, you see, this is why I like the digital way of doing it, because then you can't see what other people's votes are, and so we, get, we get more disagreement. Um, okay, so uh, Kate, I promised you that I would make you uh, tell us why the numbers matter. Thank so you for go ahead. Being Always. <laughs> um, well, so as I was debating, I thought, well, you know, a point of vaccinating is herd immunity. So if we could achieve that goal and also accommodate people's religious beliefs, that seems like a kind of desirable compromise. So it sort of depended on some empirical facts, as I was thinking about. I see. OK, so actually, then I can help a little bit with this. Um, in California, they were able to reach just the bare bottom of the herd immunity rate only after eliminating both philosophical and religious exemptions. 
So if California is representative of the rest of the country, it seems that you need to eliminate religious exemptions in order to achieve herd immunity. So nobody voted against this, so I want to make you generate the reasons. Why might somebody oppose the bill to uh, eliminate the religious exemption? Yeah? It, it seems like it's getting close to the establishment or, or disestablishment of certain religions more, of saying certain religions are sort of not acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and that just is something that makes me feel very uncomfortable with. Yeah, so, so you might think that um, allowing the religious exemption is a, w is a kind of compromise that enables us to respect religious freedom while at the same time requiring students, to be, students in school to be vaccinated. And if we take away the religious exemption, our compromise is gone. And now there's this, you know, public schooling is directly at odds with um, people's religious practice. That's why it seems like there are two internal questions, the herd immunity question, but the second one about sort of which to it, you know, how many, well, what percent of the religious population is in mm -hmm. effect you know, excluded from public schools if you yeah. do this, because having a situation where your public schools are all for non-religious people, all religious people are being privately schooled or public schools does mm -hmm. not seem like an outcome that we want. Um, we might want, we might be worried about that for reasons of uh, educational equity. We might also worry about that for reasons of public health. Um, so uh, imagine all of your uh, unvaccinated kids are now going to the same school. So um, if we don't have herd immunity one way or another, but we do concentrate all the unvaccinated kids together, we might actually be worse off in terms of public health than we were before. And that's an empirical question that I don't have the answer to. And there's just the social division issues as well. That's right. Um, Along those lines, are there any other ethical dimensions of this um, situation that you found troubling while thinking through it, or that gave you pause? Yeah, Kaya. I was also wondering to what extent children's will should be respected in this debate. Um, I also read some news about teenagers getting vaccinated uh, this, like, in spite of the parents' mm -hmm. refusal uh, to have him vaccinated. So that's another dimension that I thought was missing. Yeah, so there might be a, um, it, most of the kids that we saw in this clip are too young to be able to, um, for us to attribute to them any belief one way or another about whether they want to be vaccinated. But there was recently this um, viral case of this, this kid who then testified before Congress about vaccination, um, who is, a, I think, a junior or a senior in high school and uh, went on Reddit looking for information about how to vaccinate himself against his mother's wishes. and so. Um, that, that got a lot of attention. For older kids, for, for most kids who are in school, that wouldn't be relevant because they would be too young to, for us to um, attribute to them a wish one way or another. But, um, but even for those younger kids, we might say, okay, suppose they have no um, wishes one way or another about whether to be vaccinated. Still, the wish not to be vaccinated is their parents, and the cost of not being allowed to attend public school is their own. And we might think that there's some unfairness in excluding kids from school on those grounds. Um, I wonder if anybody wants to speak to why they voted yes in spite of that and in spite of their concern about um, religious establishment. Yeah. Just the herd immunity reason as a Trump thing. Concern. Yeah. Yeah, Javier. Well, you might think even if you still frame it in terms of like fairness considerations, like fairness to the child. Well, then similarly, if you don't say invoke this sort of um, uh, legislation and you don't say meet the herd immunity requirements, well, no, you're putting in risk children, I mean, both children whose parents didn't make the decision, but children who certainly didn't make the decision. So you might think like there is gonna, there's fairness considerations at least on both sides. Right, so if, if schools are, are unsafe for a student like Mia Hockett who's immunocompromised to attend, then somebody doesn't get to go to school. And then you might think, okay, well, the question is, which somebody is it gonna be? The somebody whose parents object to vaccination or the somebody who has an, immune, an autoimmune disorder or who's in chemotherapy? Yeah. But it's not just those kids, because any child could die from measles. That's you right. don't know in advance. So That's we right. don't know what, which population to separate out. Um, 
uh, under that scenario. Uh, so uh, you're saying that even student, even kids who do have their vaccinations are put at risk by um, the uh, lack of herd immunity in schools. Is that, am I understanding you right? I was thinking of, okay. I, I, I don't know if in the, the case that was presented here uh, of the child that couldn't be immunized is the only case where a child would have a medical exemption. Uh, yes, yes, there are, there are other kinds of medical exemptions that somebody may have. They may be allergic, for example, to one of the um, ingredients in the vaccine. So if somebody has an allergy to eggs, eggs are sometimes an ingredient in vaccines, and that person might not be able to okay. be safe. We, sorry, I was wrong. Yeah. We, we would know. Yeah, the, um, the, would everybody who has a medical exemption would know that they have it. Yeah. What's the residual risk? Sorry, that's the other, that's the other point. What's the residual risk? Is it close to zero? To those, vaccinated? Who, to those who are vaccinated. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually don't know um, to tell you in numbers, but what I, I can tell you is that um, even for those who are vaccinated, it's much safer to be in a place where their likelihood of encountering somebody with measles is very low. So everybody is affected, even those who are vaccinated by um, the, the low vaccination rates because everybody is more likely to encounter someone with measles. However, the risk to somebody who's not vaccinated is enormously greater because Measles is extremely contagious, and many of those who aren't vaccinated are not vaccinated because they're also health compromised in other ways. So they face extremely high risk. Um, Brian, you walked in late, but I remember that you had some concerns about a bill like this. Do you want to um, share them? Sorry to put you on the spot. You can say no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to recall the specifics of this case. Um, so yeah, so just the question is whether um, Vermont should should change its law so that um, only students with a medical exemption to vaccination can attend public schools without being vaccinated. So anybody who objects to vaccines on religious or philosophical or theoretical grounds um, must either forego public edu public school education or vaccinate anyway. Truthfully, I'll let you. I'll let you voice it for me. I don't recall what I. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's fair enough. Sorry. Um, okay. So uh, I'll. I think we've aired a lot of the considerations that are relevant in this in this case, and I hope that that's given you kind of a feel for um, what a moderated discussion of these issues might look like. Um, for your own teaching, you might also want to think about what assignments you would con connect with these questions. Um, what kind of, uh, of the many different branches that we opened up and many different can of worms that we started to touch on, which of them would be useful for your students to open up and delve into more deeply? Um, and that question may be guided by uh, what you anticipate that your students may face later on or which questions you feel personally equipped to address. Okay, um, so I wanted to close by talking a little bit about um, the obstacles to embedding ethics in your teaching. One obstacle that I uh, anecdotally have confronted a lot when I've talked to people in computer science about this is that um, in our model uh, with embedded ethics, we send a philosopher to the classroom to teach this material. But in most classrooms, that's not possible. So the person teaching the material is not an expert in ethics or in philosophy and may feel ill-equipped to handle um, these issues. So um, I had a, a computer science professor tell me um, if my students asked me whether it, an argument was consequentialist or deontological, I would not know how to answer that question. Um, that kind of thing can, can um, be an obstacle for somebody to feel that they can effectively teach this stuff. Um, another issue is a lack of clarity about learning goals. Um, instructors might worry that they're not in a position to tell students what answer is right or not. And I tried to make the argument to you that we don't need to teach students which is the right answer. Um, in order to effectively build the students' virtues and abilities to tackle ethical questions. Um, but I think that confusion on that issue and the feeling that we do need to have the right answer might constitute an obstacle. And then finally, this issue about being afraid to bring the controversy into the classroom. So let's talk about each of these in turn. First, lack of confidence with moral philosophy. Um, when I taught uh, that 
uh, that first case in computer science, I s showed the students the can of worms that we were not going to get into. And I told them there's lots and lots of issues that, um, that this connects with that we don't have the time or the ability to address adequately. So um, I, I told them, you know, come to my office hours and we can talk more, but we're not going to be able to get into everything. Um, this can also be a way of handling uh, issues with which you don't feel confident. So if you were teaching the last case and you thought there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, oh, you know what, it came up in our discussion that uh, Kate asked what is the nature of the religious objection and I was like, Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't actually want to give it a shot. <laughs> I don't want to try to state what the Jehovah's Witnesses objection to vaccination is. Um, it's fine to tell your students transparently, um, I, I don't know or um, I have an inkling, but I'm not confident in it. it. It's okay to show students that you don't know. It's okay to draw on students' knowledge. So if there's somebody in the classroom who says, I can tell you why Jehovah's Witnesses object to vaccination, it's fine to let the student contribute that. Um, I think it also can be helpful to bring um, experts in. So that may, be, that may mean faculty in the philosophy department, that may mean the person who in your school teaches professional ethics, or um, you know, anybody with uh, maybe job experience confronting these, uh, these kinds of problems. And what getting them on your team might look like could be anything from having coffee with them and talking through the issue and getting their take, um, all the way up to co-teaching the way that we do in, in the embedded ethics program. Second, lack of clarity about learning goals. So in this group, we don't have that problem because look, we know what all the learning goals are. They're that whole thing. Um, I also have a, a handout that you can grab on your way out that lists all of these learning goals and gives a little bit of textual summary for what is depicted in those images. Um, I hope we, I'll, I'll have a moment later to um, ask questions. And I know that this may, may not be an adequate answer for all of you, but I hope that um, this way of thinking about it helps address at least that problem of um, feeling that because I don't know all the answers to an ethical question, it follows that I can't be the teacher in a classroom that's asking an ethical question. Um, so, so my hope is that you no longer feel that that is the case and you can go forth to your colleagues and convince them of the thing. Okay, finally, concerns about bringing controversial material into the classroom. So for the last um, hour and 15 minutes or so, we've been talking about vaccines. Um, these were the norms that I started us off with. And now my question for you is, and we won't be able to do it electronically because it doesn't work, but um, do you feel that we lived up to these norms? You got people close their eyes closed. Yeah, let's do that. Heads down <laughs> or eyes closed. Raise your hand if you think that we lived up to the norms of respect and inclusiveness. Hands down. Raise it. Wait, eyes closed still. Raise your hand if you feel we did not. Okay. Hands down, and raise your hand if you oops, close. And raise your hand if you don't know. Okay. Um, eyes open. So, will somebody who voted that they don't know start us off? Actually, I should tell you what I learned. The vast majority of you voted that we did live up to these norms. But um, part of the reason I included "don't know" as one of the voting options is because. I think that if you feel included, you might think, oh, this was an adequately inclusive discussion. And so you might think, well, it depends on what other people feel, how, you know, how I should vote. So I wonder if um, those who voted don't know might be able to um, share why they don't feel that they know. Oh, but both of the people, so there are two people who voted don't know, but they both walked in late. So that might be why you don't know. Um, okay, so um, one person voted no, or v voted kind of a tentative no. Do you feel you want to share your reasons? I can share, but I will be exhibiting the same thing. I don't think I lived up to the step up, step back. Oh, well. <laughs> thank you for but being so open about that. Generally, I think, I'm not sure as a room, we totally did achieve that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So we didn't all, you know, some people didn't participate, some people participated several times. It is what it is. I'm glad, though, that that's the concern that you had, because when I went into this, I was very worried about the um, 
humor and assume best intentions bullet points on here. I was very worried about whether we would be adequately inclusive of the um, anti-vaccination perspective. So I'll just share a little bit of my thinking about that. Um, I, uh, I have one person in my social cir circle who is very anti-vaccines, um, and that person did not want to speak to me on the record about this issue, but um, her spouse did and told me that um, if, if she were, so if my anti-vax friend were a college student, nothing I would do would make her feel comfortable participating. She said, you know, if vaccines are on the table, she would not participate, period. Um, and so I decided my goal was to run this discussion in such a way that even though that voice might not be heard in the classroom, we wouldn't, we wouldn't contribute to her feeling that she isn't safe to, um, to bring her own perspective on vaccines in. I also felt very strongly that we needed to have this discussion from the empirical baseline of the scientific consensus on vaccines. And in the process of researching, I learned that um, the anti-vaccine folks on the internet at least, um, frame their arguments in a way that does not presuppose that vaccines are not safe and effective. So if you look at what people say against vaccination, it's all about like, um, you know, everyone should be allowed to make up their own mind. I'm not saying that vaccines aren't safe. I'm saying it should be each parent's choice. I'm saying that each person should have the freedom to decide for themselves. Arguments about epistemic responsibility. Um, so you don't find a lot of people saying the reason I oppose vaccines or oppose mandatory vaccines is because vaccines are not safe and effective, though they do make that argument. They usually will say, irrespective of whether vaccines are safe and effective, I oppose da 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 da. Which is why I felt that it was fair and um, sufficiently inclusive to have this discussion on those grounds. Um, I also thought and I wonder what you all would think about this, that the issue is important enough that although I knew that by br bringing it in here I was taking a risk, I thought it's a risk worth taking. And what, what am I risking? I'm risking not being adequately inclusive. I'm risking kind of opening the door for somebody to make an insensitive comment that makes, leaves somebody else feeling terrible. Um, so that's a, a risk I'm taking on somebody else's behalf, right? I'm risking somebody else's well-being, not my own. And that didn't feel like a very comfortable thing to do. But my own kind of ethical thinking through this as a teacher was that I'm not willing to not teach something because teaching it would pose that risk. So kind of similarly to the way that we discussed the journalism case, I thought um, it's not a yes or no question, it's a how. And so I'm going to do it in the way that feels to me most kind of um, displaying the virtue of inclusiveness um, and protective of that virtue, and then we'll see what happens. So I'm happy to see that those who felt we may not have lived up to all of our norms did not feel that, it was, that this presentation was not inclusive on those grounds. But I also would encourage you to um, be willing to take risks as a teacher with controversial material, even though um, those risks are uh, risks that you're taking with respect to other people's well-being, because the choice not to take the risks is, is also um, costly. Yeah, back here. You know, I wrestle with this engaged positions, not people, and, and partly with the, you know, how you've raised it now is, say we're talking about transgendered people in the military. And I think students sometimes will push back on this engaged positions, not people, of saying, but they are people. <laughs> and those risks are borne perhaps more heavily on certain students than others. And um, so I, I think there's, there's something challenging of thinking about when people say, you know, my moral philosophy comes from <coughs> my gender, my religion, my race, my background, and separating it out as if people are somehow neutral is something that I wrestle with whether or not there's something, I don't know if it's dishonest about that, about what's really happening in the room under the surface. Um, so, and this is not, you know, obviously this is engaged positions, not people is something a lot of us do and is very common as a ground rule, but I really wrestle with that piece of where the identity of the students in the room 
can be reconciled with that. Yeah. Thank you for that. I wonder if anybody, we have a lot of teaching experience amongst us. So does anybody have any thoughts about how to handle that very challenging issue? Yeah. I'm terrified of answering an opinion given the context, but um, I'm reminded maybe in political philosophy of a communitarian critique of um, notions of justice that you can't say you can't um, you can't put everyone in the original position and say what would be the way in which we would organise as as a site as what would be the way in which we would organize ourselves as a society if we separate out our gender, our race, our educational background. And I, I take it communitarians would say, well, you can't do that. That's absurd. And, and perhaps that's the same, that's relevantly similar to this kind of critique, which I have a lot of sympathy for. Yeah. So no genius solution for me, I'm afraid. But I think there's a, a, wider, a wider issue here about thinking about politics and ethics. Yeah. But so really more grist for your mill that um, it may be that the idea of, the, of separating the position from the person doesn't make sense on a very deep level. So, um, but you did mention that this is a common ground rule. Does anybody um, here use it in their classrooms? Yeah, Kai. I don't use the exact language, but I show examples of. Oh. I sometimes introduce examples of personal attack and attack on positions. For example, personal attack, you know, could include statements like, it is stupid of you to claim X, Y, Z, or yeah. it is, on the other hand, you could say it is really great of you to claim X, X, Y, Z, like those are personal sort of blame or personal praise, whereas, um, there are certain phrases that students can use to comment on the position, not on the people. For example, you could say, um, communitarian perspective on XYZ is, I think, blah, blah, blah. So um, when students seem to have struggle um, distinguishing positions and people, I introduce these phrases so that students can make a distinction. So this, I think, um, I think this can kind of sit compatibly with the concern that you two raised which is that, um, I, I'm, uh, well, I, let me know if I'm wrong about this. I suspect that the concern that you, you brought out um, about um, students bringing their whole personality and, and the entirety of who they are to bear on controversial questions that arise in the classroom um, can happen even if we um, abide by the guideline that Kaya is spelling out and always, so, we, um, we don't say, you know, it's stupid of you to think da 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 da, or it's, or it's brilliant of you to, you know, to think this and that. Um, but, but the this and that, the content of the, the position itself bears on who we are as people. So let's suppose that we're arguing about affirmative action. And let's suppose that a student uh, is a, a racial minority that benefits from, you know, the, the minority benefits from affirmative action and that student is in the classroom feeling very vulnerable because here we are debating affirmative action and maybe their classmates are assuming that they are the beneficiary of affirmative action. And maybe when their classmates say we shouldn't have affirmative action, they're talking about me, let's say. Now, all of that can be going on in a student's head even while everyone respects this ground rule of saying, you know, we're, we're talking about the position of being for and against, we're talking about the arguments, we're not talking about the person making the arguments, that's all fine. Still, the argument is about me and whether I have a right to be here. So this is to say, Kaya, I don't disagree with you, but I think that the problem persists even after this way of, of um, putting the ground rule. So, go on, step up, Danielle. <laughs> well, I, I do use that, but I also add a part two to it, which is recognize when the position is existentially threatening to somebody. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece to that, which is, and then you have to think out loud about how to mitigate that existential threat, which means how do you um, think about how that person will feel that they're safe, that they can trust the community that they're working with. So I do think you have to add that second part about recognizing positions are existentially threatening. I saw a hand back there. 
just to say that I really fully agree with her. I mean, you have to set up the rules that are, you know, really uh, right out there that people may be offended by the type of discussions that will take place. And you, you have to get the civility right out. You know, we have at, the, at Rockefeller people that come from Latin America that are very controversial figures that have done a lot of crazy things out there. And civility comes through when you see a lot of people that come from opposite directions that really want, and in Latin America we take democracy really, really strongly. I don't know why. We fight for it, we kill for it, really. So you have these people that are really, really uh, at odds with, with each other, and you have to really set up the rules right up front uh, to be sure that you don't get anything crazy happening there. And sometimes the police are out there in the background just in case. <laughs> And, and when you're teaching the police, you may feel it's you, and so that may feel like quite a, quite a burden for you to carry. I think that um, both of what, one thing that comes out of both of your comments is that there is no rule about what kinds of words we can say that will guarantee that people will confront each other in a civil and respectful way. Um, I think one thing that we can do is um, model civility t for our students. Uh, so I, I hope that the comment about, say, um, not making jokes at others' expense and assuming best intentions for, uh, assuming that people who don't vaccinate also have best intentions were moments where I was uh, um, aiming to at least model for you the kind of civility that I expected in the discussion. Um, for myself, I've found it useful to um, be really transparent with my students when I expect some of the class material to be existentially threatening, as Danielle put it and um, empower the students. So let them know that I'm not expecting that I will be the only police person. You know, I'm not gonna police the discussion. I expect it to be a community effort to, um, to impose the community norms. So I might not notice that somebody back here feels threatened or hurt by some aspect of the discussion. And I can't always notice that because I only have my own personal background and perspective with which I approach any given topic. But what I can do is tell my students that my door is always open and I'm always happy to hear them and I'm always happy to stand up for them if they feel that the class discussion violated our norms. I can prepare myself to um, reset the classroom norms and build civility and forgiveness after a violation happens. And I can empower students to say something in the moment if they feel like things are not going well. That like it's okay to raise your hand and say, "I think we're I think we're going off the rails. This isn't okay for me," and that I'm willing to hear that and welcome that in my classroom. So um, none of these is a magic bullet, and none of these will prevent students from ever doing something that violates the norms. But um, those are kind of resources that I hope might be helpful to you. Okay, um, just to. Um, where are we on time? Uh, close to that. So one last thing I want to give you is suppose that you're teaching your class tomorrow and you want to incorporate ethics right away. So here's a, a kind of recipe for a, a learning activity that you can do with almost no preparation. Um, find some ethical issue that connects to your course material. And that might look like a video like the videos that I showed you here. Um, ask students to identify some ethical considerations in play. So in uh, one computer science class that I taught, uh, I had students literally list reason, uh, reasons that a given technology might be socially beneficial and ways that it might be risky or harmful. And just the activity was pure brainstorming. So just make a list. Um, actually, that's not true. I, I made it a little more complicated. I had them made, make a list, and then I had this, them sort the list into categories. So I wanted them to identify some risks and, and benefits that come from one way of thinking of the technology and some risks and benefits that come from another way of thinking about the technology just to get their brains flowing a little bit more. But a pure brainstorming activity would also be OK. Um, if you can identify some kind of task that they might do in, in the future if they go on to use the skills that you're teaching in their course. So if it's computer scientists, maybe they're designing a technology. If it's teachers, maybe they're designing a curriculum. If it's journalists, maybe they're wearing a story, whatever it may be. And either, there's sort of two approaches. One is to um, give them a, a problem that has a lot of different uh, ethical considerations that bear on it and 
just have them do something creative with that where they try to make, you know, get the most good while doing the least harm. Or you can force a direct confrontation of values. So like um, in, this, in this simulation, you have to be dishonest in order to um, do a bunch of good for a lot of people. But how do you weigh dishonesty against these benefits? So um, either force a hard choice or um, give them a, an opportunity to be creative. And then debrief. Uh, just invite them to air what, how they felt about doing the exercise, what went well, what was hard about it, if they work in teams, how did their communication go. All of this gives them practice in those ethical skills that I showed you on, on the body. Um, and don't worry about writing it all down because it's all on the handout. Um, okay, uh, we already did a little bit of Q&A, but I wanted to, um, in, the, in the just let, next couple of minutes, invite questions about the big picture of this presentation, or if you have any residual thoughts. Yeah. Um, how long is the ethics module in CS courses? Uh, Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. How long is the module? Um, that's my first question. Second, the second question is, how I, I can imagine some students falling into this like relativist trap, and I was wondering how you will avoid that as a teacher. Yeah, so um, the typically the module consists of a lecture and assignment and office hours. Um, so the lecture is however long the lectures are for that class. Um, the assignment is, uh, you know, sized appropriately for the type of assignments that they do. Um, so maybe you say like a, a 400 word paper um, or something bigger, it might be a coding assignment. Um, but, but it's very variable depending on what the professor is interested in doing. Um, and your second question is how do we deal with the fact that students bring relativism, or I'll broaden the question, any kind of um, way of sort of not feeling comfortable directly confronting an ethical question. Um, I, uh, I think different teachers do this different ways. What works for me is to begin with a posture of everybody is welcome to come as they are into the classroom. And if what they bring to the classroom is relativism, great, bring it. Um, I, I try to give students problems that will be interesting and um, that will give them something to chew on wherever they, their starting point is. So um, how, what that might look like for a student who comes in with a kind of relativist-like, uh, and, and when you say the trap of relativism, I'm assuming you mean like a very unsophisticated version of it, because somebody could be a quite sophisticated relativist. Um, but if a student comes in with a kind of posture of like, who knows, man, ethics, it's all your opinion. Um, so I try to give them problems that will get their blood boiling, um, and that's part of why I, I court controversy. <laughs> um, I want them to feel that if they give that answer, they better be able to defend it because that is quite a, you know, a problematic answer to give. So if they, if they see this Facebook thing, um, you know, people are sharing anti-vax stuff all over Facebook, and they think, well, who's to say what's right or wrong? Um, I think that the harm that, uh, that we're talking about of, of kids getting measles, and there's like, Right now, the US is experiencing its worst measles epidemic since the invention of the measles vaccine, I believe. Um, that's, those stakes are high. And it's hard for students to, to go, who knows, man, in the face of those kinds of stakes. So that's kind of my, my approach, is to um, say, you're welcome to have that. You know, you're welcome to start wherever you're starting. And I'm going to give you something that's interesting and that will, will challenge you regardless of your starting point where you can't avoid the challenge by saying something like ethics is just your opinion. Does that, does that help? Other last thoughts, questions? Okay, I'll, we have a coffee break now. I'm going to still be here, so if you have any questions or thoughts that you want to share with me, please do. And there's a handout that Michael is holding with all the kind of texty parts that, so it's, it's a list of takeaways, and then there's also some further resources if you're interested in knowing what we did particularly in computer science. Um, there is some, uh, a link to the website where we have a repository of modules and you can look at the material that we've generated and see if it'll um, spark some ideas for you. Let's thank Ronnie. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ronnie, for sharing with us. 
again, as an ethics pedagogy fellow, Roni brings all of the, her expertise, not as, just as a philosopher or with the embedded ethics program, but her deep experience teaching uh, and shares that and brings those skills to bear with all of her consultations that she does with faculty around campus. So uh, thank you so much for modeling. We talk about the, the power of modeling. Thank you so much for modeling that for us today. Please don't go anywhere, though, because we have coffee and snacks here. And then we, in about 30 minutes, just less than 30 minutes, we'll have a presentation from the Emergent Trends and the, ethic, and the Teaching and Learning of Ethics on Campus. So this is a multi-year study that we've been doing at the center. Uh, we'd really like to share some uh, analysis and, and information and get some feedback from you. So please don't go anywhere. Have some uh, snacks. And thanks. Thanks again.